اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم Welcome to our seminar. I'm excited to see all of our students back again after our previous semester which concluded just a few weeks ago. And alhamdulillah this is a a unique turning point in our journey in that we've been learning all of these semesters uh foundational sciences that are ghaya that are um when not ghaya they are the the wasail the sciences that lead you somewhere but then often in your journey you get to a point where you're at the end goal and just like as an example when it comes to Quran tajweed is not an end goal it's not an end science it's a wasila it's a science that helps you how uh, on articulating and pronouncing the words of the Quran the end goal is what reciting the book of Allah itself directly same thing with tafsir usul tafsir or even tafsir the their wasail because you're learning how to engage the book of Allah the end goal there would be or the ghaya the science that is ghaya would be where you read the book of Allah and you contemplate yourself so all this time we've been studying hadith 101 hadith 102 we spent a lot of time doing foundational concepts relating to sunnah and hadith which is very very important i don't know my uh, phone is not working everyone mute it's it's from like a no this that's imam okay so hadith 101 we looked at foundational hadith concepts very very essential concepts uh what is sunnah what is hadith and we looked at the books of hadith we looked at some history that was all to prepare the ground for all of you and then hadith 102 we went into what is a sahih hadith what is a fabricated hadith what are all those types of hadith all that terminology again that was a means to an end now we arrive at the end and that end is to open up these beautiful primary books that Allah blessed this ummah with and to open up sahih al-bukhari and begin to read it and to extract its pearls and its gems and its wisdom and its beauty and its guidance um so obviously to get there was a long process for many many of many of us and with that I'll speak to I guess some of the new students who haven't taken uh, hadith 101 or 102 and there are quite a number of people online as well in person that have never taken class with us and they're here today so I do welcome all of you but at the same time you have to realize you know we're at the end and to get here it was a long journey for the rest of the students you won't benefit fully from the seminar without the background without the uh preliminary information all the work groundwork that we laid laid out having said that so how do you catch up if you have the time commitment you have the, the energy and the zeal and the enthusiasm um you know welcome aboard um i'll provide you the playlist of all of the classes of hadith 101 and 102 so you can start watching them put them on a faster speed if you have to and just go through those because you know there are many many pathways to hadith there are various uh, methodologies and frameworks and looking at hadith none of them are right or wrong some of them are more correct than others so the way we approach hadith we have a particular way of doing it uh, we have a particular framework we use, and most of you who have been with me for a while are familiar with you know, my thoughts and ideas, um, and they come from my teachers, they're not for myself. Um, so I, I bring uh, to the table all the hadith learning, I, uh, the training I received of Sheikh Akram Nadwi, for instance, and his brilliant insights into hadith and Sahih Bukhari and others. So. You'll be lost in the seminar if you don't catch up and if you don't, um, you know, come through that door of Hadith 101 and 102. So having said that, after the seminar, I'll provide the playlist, um, the Telegram group. For those who are new, you communicate on one uh, channel on Telegram. Um, I did send a welcome email out to all the students, but I won't be sending periodic emails. Um, we'll only communicate on Telegram, so that's where you need to join that channel. Um, and that's where we will post announcements and, and uh, matters pertaining to the class going forward. 
And we'll post a playlist there, so you feel free to watch them. You don't have to complete them before the first session. The first session is already underway. But you can do them simultaneously. So in the next couple of weeks, if you can kind of watch those videos, and then there's there's exams that I can provide for you as well, so you can get credit for those seminars. So welcome aboard. Um, I wanted to begin uh, to set the stage for this seminar. I wanted to begin this way. To understand Okay, what I wanted to begin with is to take a look at the environment that produced Imam al-Bukhari. Okay, to understand a, an author, a great thinker, um, there are many ways uh, or many avenues to decipher who that person was and what he brought to us. And one of those things is you look at the biography of the individual. Another is you look at the environment that produced individuals like that. because. You know, all of you live in communities, you know that great individuals, um, they're a product of great parents, great environments, great communities. So to understand the true impact of anyone and someone as brilliant as Imam al-Bukhari, you have to put yourself in the mindset and, and take, uh, put yourself in history and look at that environment that where he lived, and that was medieval Khurasan in the fourth century of the Hijra calendar. So you're looking at in the year 200s through 300s, that environment produced a wealth of individuals, amazing people um, who are all devoted to Hadith. So there is one particular story that's very memorable for me, and we'll share that story. It's about an individual who was one of the teachers of Imam al-Bukhari. So to understand Bukhari, you have to understand the teacher. So this particular teacher of Imam al-Bukhari was Nasr ibn Ali al-Jahdami. Nasr ibn Ali al-Jahdami. So one thing about this seminar compared to other seminars will be that there will be minimal slides. There will be a lot of instruction, so you'll be taking notes. In the previous seminars, everything has been on our slides. So, you know, all the information, uh, we go step by step. But this is an advanced seminar. Now that we're reading a, a book as complex as Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari. Um, so now you have to change gears a little bit and you have to start um, investing more in your own note taking and creating your own patterns and, and, and charts and, and so on and so forth. So Nasr bin Ali al-Jahdami is a great hadith expert in Basra, Basra in Iraq. And he was one of the teachers of Bukhari. What's interesting about him, he was a teacher of not only Imam al-Bukhari, he was a teacher of Imam Muslim. He was also a teacher of Imam Abu Dawood. He was also a teacher of Imam Tirmidhi. He was also a teacher of Imam Nasa'i. And he was a teacher of Ibn Majah. So all six muhaddithin who are the authors of the primary hadith canon, he was a teacher that was common to all of them. And that's kind of unique. It's not that common because Imam Bukhari had his own set of teachers. There were a lot of teachers that were overlapping among all of them. But there were many teachers Imam Bukhari had, Imam Muslim did not have. There were many teachers some of the other uh, hadith experts had that some of these individuals did not because they all didn't live in the same exact time period. They kind of overlap uh, in the same uh, generation or two. But they weren't all neighbors. And they, don't, they didn't all live and die at the exact same time. So there are a handful of teachers, um, I believe it's less than a dozen, that when you read their biography, it says Shaykh al Jama'ah. Shaykh al Jama'ah means the Shaykh of the group. What does that mean, Shaykh al Jama'ah? It means all six. So there are a handful of teachers that were so famous that they were the teachers of all six of the primary hadith authors, the hadith canon authors. So that's interesting. What does that tell you? It tells you Nasr bin Ali must have been very famous. Um, and these teachers must have been, uh, first of all, they must have been experts. And they must have been so famous that uh, even all six of these individuals sought them out and learned from them. And Nasr bin Ali was one such person. So this particular incident for advanced students, you want, you want to start referencing everything. 
Everything I tell you and every story or incident I relate, if you're going to start quoting that, um, in a khutbah, it doesn't really matter, but if you're going to write a paper or you're going to start quoting, you need to start learning the references. So, um, so those of you who are more advanced, want to look things up and read more, maybe you'll gain some insight that I didn't um, understand reading the story. So this particular incident comes, Ibn al-Jawzi relates it in his books. Ibn al-Jawzi was a prolific Hanbali author. And also Al-Mizzi, one of the Hadith experts who wrote one of the reference works in Hadith criticism, um, Al-Mizzi's book, Tahdib al-Kamal. Um, so he has this incident in there as well. So I'll read the incident in Arabic parts of it. Um, and it's just, I want you to take yourself back to medieval Khurasan. And it's a story, it's an interesting story, it's extremely funny. Um, about this particular teacher, Imam Bukhari, Muslim, and all the other hadith experts. So it says, li, so he says, Hadathana Nasr bin Ali, Nasr bin Ali related this incident uh, about his personal life. He says, li jarun I used to have a neighbor, Jarun Tufayli. Anyone know what Tufayli is? Yeah, so Tufayli is close to that, Tufayli, childish, but. Um, it has another meaning. Like there were a group of people known as Tufayliyim. There was a particular practice that they used to engage in. So, I mean, it's, maybe it's not that common anymore, but Tufayli is a person that, you know, Junaid? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Someone who goes to feast for free. So someone who goes to parties uninvited. Okay, uh, what's an English word for that? Party crashers. <laughs> so, you know, in, in medieval Islamic culture, there were a lot of parties, right? Um, like parties, by parties, we mean feasts. You know, you would have like a circumcision feast, you would have a wedding feast, and there was a culture of people who would attend these, um, you know, uninvited. And, um, they became known as Tufaylin. Why? It goes back to an individual who was first one known for this practice, Tufayl ibn Zalal. He was an unlucky fellow who, you know, used to attend parties uninvited and became famous for that for the first time. And this whole phenomenon became named after him. So his name was Tufayl. Now Tufayliyun and Tatfil is the verb or the verbal noun. It means the one who, or the art of, or the phenomenon of party crashing. So uh, Khatib al-Baghdadi wrote a nice book um, that has also this story in it, and it's translated in English. It's called The Art of Party Crashing by Khatib al-Baghdadi. It's, it's, a, it's a really nice book full of like jokes and um, funny anecdotes. Anyways, li jarun okay? So he said, I had a neighbor who was a party crasher. And he was one of the best looking people in terms of how he dressed. Um, and then he began to describe him, Ajmalum, Libasan, and so on and so forth. And his thing was, every time I was invited anywhere, he would follow me and just go to that party in my name. Not as a companion, but just following behind him, right, without him knowing. And he, and he eventually found out. But he said, I had this neighbor, he would just follow me to every party, every place I went, like where there was food. Not just every place, but where there was food. Until people began to think that he was one of my companions. And he was not. So one day he said, Anna Ja'far ibn al-Qasim al-Hashimi, Amir al-Basra. One day the Amir or the, the governor of Basra, he was circumcising his son and he was going to throw a party. It was a custom at that time when you circumcise your child and at least the political people, the governors and the authority, they would hold a huge public feast. And he said, I knew that I would be invited and he said, I made up my mind, I'm going to expose this guy today. So Nasr bin Ali, the teacher, he says, today I'm going to expose this person. 
And he says, you know, I was just waiting for the messenger to come knocking at the door, come to the feast, you know, um, we're ready for you. So, and then he said, uh, If this man follows me today, I'm going to expose him. So, and he said, I was thinking about the fana'ala dhalika idha ja'a idh ja'a rasulu, uh, rasuluhu yad'uni. He said, I was thinking about that, and then, lo and behold, the messenger came from the palace and to invite me. Um, so he said, so, فَخَرَجْتُ فَإِذَا أَنَا وَالْتُفَيْلِ I came out, and that man is all dressed up, the neighbor standing on the side, waiting for me to go, so he could just follow me. So he said he followed me all the way to the palace, and then uh, he was already ready before me. So he already knew. So he, these people plan everything. They knew that there was going to be a party and he was already all dressed up. So he said, um, I began to walk for Tabi'arni and he began to follow me in the streets. So it's not, we're not talking side by side. They're not friends. They're just, he's following like half a block down, just uh, un, unnoticed. So he said, we entered Dar al-Amir, Jalasna Sa'atan, and then we sat about an hour talking and then the food came. And then I attended the table. And he said, there were a group of people on this big table with me. And he said, <clears throat> all of them were eating. And then this man, he took his hand out to grab the food. Right? He's sitting at the table. When he extended his hand to grab the food, uh, I began to relate a hadith. So as soon as he puts his hand out, Kind of awkward, right? Imagine the scene puts his hand out and he goes, Hadathana. So he says, Hadathana Durust ibn Ziyad an Aban ibn Tariq. Durust ibn Ziyad related to me from Aban ibn Tariq an Nafir an ibn Umar. From Nafir from ibn Umar, Qal Qala Rasulullahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Man dakhala dara qawmin bughayri idnihim. The Messenger of Allah said, Whoever enters someone's house without his permission, uh, and he eats their food. He enters and leaves as a thief. So he relates this hadith and he stopped. And then he said, That man, the Tufayli, the party crasher, when he heard that, he thought about, you know, he paused for a moment and he said, Anfatta laka wallahi abu amar min had al kalam. He said, I can't believe you said that. So this man, the party crusher, he said to Nasr bin Ali, I cannot believe you related that hadith. And then he began to explain, he said, He said, relating something like this, you know, everyone sitting here is going to think you're talking about them. What kind of adab is that? So he began, he, he turned the tables on him. He said, I cannot believe you related this hadith. And now you're accusing everyone here because everyone is thinking for a moment, is that him? Then he said, Awal, um, tastahi. Are you not ashamed of yourself? And you feel no shame relating a hadith like this at the table of the one who's most generous. Someone who's most generous, who feeds people and loves to feed people, speaking about the governor. And then he said, Are you not ashamed to prevent people from eating food that doesn't belong to you? You're a guest here too. Why in the world are you preventing other people or talking about, it's not even your food. It's the food of someone who's most generous. And you feel no shame relating hadith from Durust ibn Ziyad and he's a weak narrator. So this is the party crasher. And that's true, Durus was someone unreliable. And then he says, Aban ibn Tariq, wa huwa matruk al hadith. And Durus relates from Aban ibn Tariq, you feel no shame relating this isnad, and Aban is someone who's deemed matruk al hadith, someone whose hadith is not taken. And this is a hadith that is not a, is a, is, 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 is not a real hadith. Wal muslimuna ala khilafihi, li anna hukmu sariq al qata. And hukmul mughayir ayyu yu'azzar ala ma yarahu al-imam. So he says, 
And then you feel no shame relating a hadith like this where no Muslim scholar ruled this hadith, you know, uh, passed a fatwa according to this hadith. And if someone goes to someone's house uninvited, they're not sadded, their hand is not cut. No one really implemented that kind of punishment in the hadith as sadded. Uh, and he says, why did you not relate a better hadith than this? And he said, the hadith that comes from Abu Asim al Nabi, from Ibn Juraj, from Abu Abu Zubayr, from Jabir, from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Qala Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ta'amul Wahidi Yakfil Ithnain. Wa Ta'amul Ithnaini Yakfil Arba'a. Wa Ta'amul Arba'a Yakfil Thamaniya. Wa Huwa Isnadun Sahihun Wa Matnun Sahih. And this is not, so he relates a different isnad, and he said, why would you relate this hadith that's stronger? And where the prophet said, the food of one person is sufficient for two, food of two people is sufficient for four, and the food of four people is sufficient for eight. And this is a strong hadith. And Nasr bin Ali said, so, I didn't know what to say. <laughs> so he was dumbfounded. Falam yahdurni lahu jawab. No answer came out of my mouth. So I was just silent. And then, فَلَمَّا خَرَجْنَا مِنَ الْمَوْضِعِ uh, in Saraf, لَأَنْصَرِ uh, لِلْإِنْصِرَافِ فَارَقَنِي مِنْ جَانِبِ الطَّرِيقِ لَجَانِبِ الْآخَرِ And he said, when we were leaving the party, this man, he wouldn't follow behind me. He went to the other side of the road. He was so angry at me. And then he said, you know, I heard him recite some poetry and he recited it, and he relates the poetry. So this is a true incident. What does that teach you? It teaches you you know, this medieval Khurasan environment was such where the entire environment was geared towards hadith, the hadith of the Prophet So there's so much tremendous service done to the, the, the documentation of the sunnah and the hadith. And if you look at all of the great hadith experts, almost all of them were from Khurasan. Khurasan meaning the greater Persia area. They're ethnically, they're all Persian. None of them were Arab. None of the six, Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawood, Tirmidhi, Nasai. And you know, um, it's very interesting why that would be, you know, because if you look at like the history of Islam, what happened is, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Islam began in Mecca. Then he migrated to Medina and Medina became the center of Islam. And it stayed like that in, in the rest of the life of the Prophet, the four Khulafa Rashidin, until uh, perhaps Ali brought the capital to Kufa, then knowledge began to shift to that region. But for almost 30 years, the centers of, of learning were in Medina. And then fiqh was in Medina. The first school of fiqh was the Maliki school. Imam Malik is the Imam of Medina. So knowledge and, the, you know, when, when fiqh was founded, it was mostly in Medina. So you had Imam Malik, and you have Mama Shafri, what ethnic group was he? Mama Shafri. Anyone know? He was uh, from Mecca, pure Arab. So, and then what about Imam Ahmad? He was also Arab from the Shaybani tribe. But he lived in Baghdad. Only Abu Hanifa was of Persian origin. So in fiqh and in early Islam, it was mostly the center of learning was shifted towards the Arab world. But something happened in the next era when it came to the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu the entire shift, shift of gravity went towards the east and was in Persia. And there was a single Arab scholar, maybe Imam Ahmad is only, if you look at him as a muhaddith as well, he has a musnad, he was the only Arab among all of these, they were all Persians. So it's very, very interesting um, why that would be. I mean, the answer to that, I believe, you know, you'll find in, in, in Sahih al-Bukhari, there's in Kitab al-Tafsir, there's a beautiful narration about the, you know, in Surah al-Jum'ah. So the hadith is Abu Huraira relates that the Prophet Sallallahu he was saying, um, or he was relating a verse that was revealed, وَآخَرِينَ مِنْهُمْ لَمَّا يَلْحَقُوا بِهِمْ وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ So this verse in Surah al-Jum'ah, it's like the third or fourth verse. So Surah Al-Jum'ah, in the beginning it says, He is the one who sent among the Ummiyin a messenger. And then to teach them the book and purify, the, purify them and teach them the scripture. But then in the next verse, 
وَآخَرِينَ and to others لَمَّا يَلْحَقُوا بِهِمْ who have not met them yet so you have not met them yet so who are these others you have not met them yet so when that verse was revealed they were sitting in a majlis the companion as مَنْ هُمْ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ who are these people that Allah speaks about in the verse that you have not met yet so he didn't answer the question they asked three times and then that's where he famously he put his hand on the shoulder of Salman al-Farisi. So Salman was a the Persian companion sitting in the audience. So the Prophet put his hand on his shoulder and he said those famous words. What did he say? He said, He said, if Iman was as high or as far away as the Thurayya, Thurayya is the constellation, the Pylades constellation. It's a group of stars. You know, so it's a metaphor for how far it would be. If Iman was as far away as the Pylades, his people would reach it. So <clears throat> perhaps that has something to do with the shift of power or the shift of knowledge, rather, to Persia, because when it came to the Hadith and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu it was almost exclusively a Persian affair, Khurasani affair, Ajum. So that was very, very interesting. And if you look at these stories in Hadith 101, what was the first story I told you in Hadith 101? Who remembers that story? We need to make this session more interactive um, than the previous one. What's, who remembers the first Hadith story? About? Yeah, so Musa, uh, uh, take this back. Just pass it around. So tell us what was that story? What does that have to do with Persia? If you recall. Okay. Father and grandfather they went from New South Wales. Good. Good. What was the hadith about? Or the content of the hadith. Anyone want to help him out? The first hadith. The first hadith I taught you, and I told you this is the first hadith. Who remembers the first hadith? Anyone on the sister side? Come on, Tahir, you know this. What's the first hadith? Hadith, the first, what's the first hadith that we learned? Mm -hmm. Mercy. Yeah, yeah. So it's a hadith of Rahma. Hadith of Rahma. The hadith of Rahma is when you get a jazz and hadith, that's the first hadith you hear from the teacher. And then you say, Wa huwa awwal hadith and sami'tuhu min. So you say, Hadathana. So if I relate to you, if there's new students here, I relate to you the hadith. With our isnad to Sufyan ibn Uryayna, um, I'm going back to the Prophet ﷺ that he said, Ar-Rahimun yarhamuhumur Rahman, irhamu man fil ard, yarhamu kum man fil sama. The Rahimun, the people who show mercy to others, um, yarhamuhumur Rahman. Ar-Rahman, the mercy of for one shall show mercy, shall shower his mercy upon them. Irhamu man fil ard, yarhamu kum man fil sama. Have mercy on the people of the earth and the one in the heavens shall have mercy upon you. So it's a beautiful, inspiring hadith. But for some reason, all around the world, <clears throat> anywhere you go, in the Muslim world, um, when you study hadith with the jaza, with the isnad, this is the first hadith you begin with. And it's hadith al-musalsal bin awwaliyah, the first hadith. So we gave a jaza in that hadith, in hadith 101. I still have to give you the Arabic certificates, and inshallah, you'll get them soon. But the reason for that, why is it the first hadith? Because the story is there was a young boy, his father and his grandfather, they walked all the way from uh, Nishapu in Iran, all the way to Mecca to learn hadith. And when they arrived, you know, Sufyan ibn Uryayna is a great muhaddith of Mecca. He's teaching hadith, thousands of students, everyone around the world would come flock to him to learn. And he saw this young boy, he was so young, he was a child. He wasn't of learning age, but he was so inspired. He asked him, where are you from? 
And they said, this is where he came from. He was so inspired. He brought the child next to him and he said, he was kind of emotional. He said, let me teach you this hadith. And the hadith that came to his mind at that occasion was the hadith of mercy. Seeing his young boy and his father and his... So then he related to him this hadith. And Abdul Rahman, when he grew up later on, he always remembered that incident and he always began teaching his students this hadith first. Because that's the first hadith he heard from Sufyan ibn Uyayna. And it just became a tradition and caught on to this day. Everywhere you go, it's because of that inspiring story of the people of Khurasan, the people of greater Persia. So this is the environment I wanted to share with you. Um, and with that, we'll take, the, we'll take a few questions if you have any. And then it's time for Maghrib as well. We'll take a Maghrib break. Any questions? Yeah. <clears throat> Online students, just uh, if I ignore you, I forget that you're there. Just uh, unmute your mic and say something. Other. Is it a general or a general? Jahdami. 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 Jahdami.
Okay, so let's take a 10 minute break for Mulgrew prayer. We're going to walk downstairs a Mulgrew, uh, for the online students. Um, you can come back around 9, okay? 9 p.m. in show. It's 8.43 right now, 9 p.m. on Zoom. Okay, Bismillah. It's 59. <clears throat> Any questions before we begin? We had a minute or so. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, so this particular slide, I want to show you what we're covering in the seminar. So we're going to switch gears in three different tracks simultaneously. In the seminar, we want to look at the author, Imam al-Bukhari. So we'll be talking about him as a person, his biography and aspects relating to his life. Um, the primary one is in the middle, the Sahih, the work of Imam al-Bukhari. So obviously, that would be the bulk of this seminar, looking at his remarkable work and studying it also. And then number three, looking at the hadith themselves and learning about the hadith. And that's probably the end game here, which um, is what the Prophet actually taught us and what we can gain from that. So just keep that in mind. This seminar is trying to accomplish a number of simultaneous things. Now with that, let's look at Let's begin by looking at the first thing about the Sahih. So if you, which is the title, any book that you begin to study and learn, one of the first things you want to do is, well, obviously you have to look at the title of the book, right? So it's very, very important to know the title. And the title often gives you a lot of insight into what the book is about. And it solves a lot of your questions, answers a lot of your questions and solves a lot of problems. Um, so what is the title of this book? So if you have brought your copies of the Sahih, um, take them out now and look at the title of the book. What does it say? Um, or if you have them online in the PDF, open up the PDF, go to the, let me look at the, the, the cover of the book. Or sometimes the cover of the book is just a design, doesn't give you the complete title. Find the first portion of your book that has a complete title on it. Um, Often it's not the cover, so so what does it say? Uh, someone want to read what they read from there? Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. So this is the title. Um, there are a number of, um, or there are a handful of opinions about what the title is based on different manuscripts, but the predominant usage, this is the title, Al-Jami' al-Musnad al-Sahih al-Mukhtasar min umur Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sunanihi wa ayyamihi. So this is important. So the first thing you need to learn about the Sahih is what the name of the book is. And that will teach you um, many things why would it teach you many things? Because one of the things I hope you've learned by now and, and you haven't, I hope uh, this, this gets reinforced in your minds, that the earlier you go in history to the great minds of the past, their minds worked and operated on a whole different scale than ours. Uh, in today's day and age, um, you know, we write the way modern uh, or modernity teaches us to speak to people and to write for people, you have to assume that they know nothing. So the way we write, we give everyone the building blocks and we teach them from, from zero. That's not how minds in the past work. Minds in the past, everything was purposeful. Um, and they assumed the audience knew a lot. They assumed the audiences, the audience or the people that they spoke to, they had hearts that were alive that minds that knew how to think. So that's the difference between books of the past and books in present time. Um, and often there's a gap there and that leads to a lot of misunderstanding 
uh, and confusion regarding books of the past. Today you open a book. Um, how do we find books today? You have titles, you have bold face, underline, you have different colors, you have different fonts, you have headings, subheadings, subtitles, subchapters. All these things organize the work that make you, essentially it gives you the information and makes you stop thinking. That's like a profound point, it's hard to understand, but when everything is fed for you, fed to you, every single thing is fed to you, um, then your mind doesn't work. You're just getting the finished product and it's not teaching you how to think. That's the dilemma I have with some of my other seminars. Like initially when I used to teach, I used to put all the information on the slides. So my earlier courses, like the Tajweed uh, Children's Request, the Tajweed Seminar, maybe Hadith 101, every single rule is on the slide, the definitions there, color coded, you have these fancy charts. And I found over the time people who have taken these seminars, they pass, but their knowledge of Tajweed isn't solid. And when I look back and before I created these slides and charts, um, if I look back to how I studied um, and how many people learn Tajweed or any other science, you sat in a masjid and the teacher taught you from a book and just gave you all the lessons. And it was all bare bone stuff. There was no like color coding, there were no charts, there were no, so you have to create the charts in your mind and you're forced to think. And that's, I realized over the years, studying Sahih al-Bukhari with Sheikh Akram, for instance, the great Muhaddad, he doesn't use any charts. And a lot of scholars, they, they're against visual aids. They're against using all of this because it stops your mind from thinking. If you use somebody else's charts and frameworks and, and diagrams, it's interesting, it's cool. You can understand it, but it doesn't force you to think and create those mental maps in your mind yourself. And that's the difference between a book like Sahih Bukhari and books written in today's time. So Sahih al-Bukhari, so many people misunderstand it. And not only that, all the other hadith books, because they're not written for kindergartners. They're not written for people who don't know anything. Imam Bukhari wrote his book um, assuming that you knew things, assuming you're a believer, assuming your heart is in the right place, assuming that you knew how to think. And if you approach these works with that in mind, there's so much you can gain from them. But if you're looking for everything defined, you're looking for everything laid out for you, everything explained to you, then you're going to be in for a shock. And that's why people have trouble reading books of the past. But when you really look at the books of the past, they're amazing. There's such an ocean of wisdom there. Um, the Sahih of Imam Bukhari is a treasure. And I speak about the yet because I'm going to speak about it more in every single session. But this is probably the greatest work authored by any human being in the history of humanity. And if you think about that, think about, is there anyone else you can think of where you can, you know, the whole Ummah says, Qala Allah, Qala Rasulullah, and number three, the third name on the list, Rawahu al-Bukhari. Can you imagine a human being whose name is next to Allah and his messenger, and it's been like that for the last 1100 years since he died. There's no other human being, no other hadith expert. People don't say Rawahu uh, an nasai with that frequency. And people don't accept it with that frequency. People don't even mention Imam Shafi'i, Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik that much. But imagine Bukhari, when you think of Bukhari, it's etched in people's minds right after the mention of Rasulullah. So just that fact alone is something amazing. This kind of tawfiq for a human being to reach that level. I mean, you have the messenger of Allah, obviously, but he's a messenger. But a human being who's not a messenger, who didn't receive revelation, who's not even from the Sahaba to reach that level, that tells you at the very least, this is, some, this is a man who is someone amazing. He did something incredible that he reached this level that no other human being could have reached. And that is the reason why the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari is really the most remarkable book ever authored by man, after the Book of Allah. And so after the Book of Allah, to understand the Sunnah of the Prophet there is no better work. And the Sunnah of the Prophet is the greatest thing in our life. 
And there's no other book in human history that has been read this much, no other human book rather, other than obviously Allah's book. No other human book has been read as much as the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari, referenced as much as the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari, has been worked on as much as the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari, that has any printings and editions as the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari, that's been read continuously from generation to generation, um, other than Imam al-Bukhari's work. Every other book, scholars write it, and people forget it, and then they find it, they read it. And no other book on his, in history has been read continuously since the time the author authored the book to our time, generation after generation, beginning to end, and being studied except for uh, the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari. And the second book you can add to that is Muwatta of Imam Malik. That's been read continuously from generation to generation. No other book, not even the Sahih of Imam Muslim, not even all the other books. If you look at their Isnad or transmission of the books, it's not Samara in every generation. No other book has continuous Samara. Now you can understand from Hadith 102, or 101 rather, Samara. What do I mean by Samara? No other book enjoys Samara at every level of its link to us today. Someone tell me what Samara is. Seem, Neem, Alif, Ain. Yeah, but what does Samar mean literally? So like, bring it back to the name, Samar. Audition. <clears throat> yeah, online, go ahead. In audition. Yeah, audition. Audition means hearing. <clears throat> so remember, so going back now, we can relate it to Hadith 101. Remember we talked about the transmission of knowledge. The strongest ways, there are eight ways of transmitting knowledge. The strongest one was what? Sama. So in, in the Islamic ethos, the strongest form of transmitting knowledge is Sama, which is hearing directly from the teacher or hearing from the messenger, his recitation of the book of Allah, Sama, rather than reading from a page. So that's the strongest form of transmission. Then there's Qira'a, which is reading from a page or reciting back to a teacher. But Sama is the strongest. So when we say there's Samar in every level in the Isnad of Bukhari, that means every single level, there are people who read the whole book beginning to end because it was a remarkable book. No other book is like that. Even in, um, outside of the Islamic tradition, no book has been continuously read in every generation and documented that we read it. It's not any, any of the works of Shakespeare, the Iliad of Homer, and the Odyssey of Homer, and things like that. They've been read. They became popular, then people stopped reading them, then they're written down, people discover them. But we're talking about continuous auditory transmission, which is the strongest form of knowledge, which is since the time Imam Bukhari authored his book, thousands of students sat and read the whole book beginning to end with him, documenting every syllable and every word, every hadith. And then they did the same with their students and the same with their students until they reached the books. And even when the books were compiled, when the printing press was founded, people continued to read the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari with teachers. And this is what we're trying to do in this project for the next couple of years, inshallah. Um, so, so what my point, the point I was trying to make is a brilliant work like that, that has that kind of tawfiq, every single word in that book is meaningful. And every single word that's not in the book is meaningful. That means the inclusions, Imam Bukhari's inclusions are meaningful and his exclusions are equally meaningful because these are great minds and thinkers. When they add something, it's a reason. When they put a name in the title, it's for a reason. And when they don't add something in the book, if there's something missing in the book, there's also a reason for that. Saying so you can't get that kind of detail with any other mind, but great authors like this. So with that in mind, we want to look at the, the, the title and see what it means, because there aren't extra words here. You know, the past scholars weren't verbios. They didn't repeat themselves for no reason. If they repeated themselves it was because of a reason, there's some benefit. Nowadays, you can skip many pages and, of, of books written by contemporary authors, and you won't get anything. You won't lose anything, rather. But um, in the past, they would never use extra ink. No word was extra. 
um, at least for the great experts and thinkers and authors. So word by word, what is the first word in the title? Everyone can say it together. The first word, first word, al jamia. So let's let's decipher each one. So like, what does that mean? So al jamia, what does that mean? Like general meaning or in the context of hadith? Collection, okay. From uh, what's the root word? Jama, which means to gather, right? So al jamia is that which gathers. So it's the active participle, right? Al jamia. Um, but what does it mean? It has a particular meaning in in Hadith sciences. So again, Hadith 101. This was in Hadith 101. Um, so what does Al Jamir mean as a Hadith collection? Who remembers? Yeah, but um, there are many other books by category as well. So, but what does it mean when you say a book is a jamia versus something else? Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, it collects everything. So the. So al jamia the sense is jama'ah. Jama'ah means the gathering, the group. Uh, so it has a comprehensive uh, uh, sense there or implication in the meaning. So, so we, we mentioned in Hadith 101, so a jamia collection of Hadith, is a comprehensive Hadith book that contains eight major chapters. Okay, so because some Hadith books only have like, you know, uh, ahkam. Some hadith books only have certain topics, but a jamia hadith book is one that contains eight major chapters. What are those chapters? Um, number one, iman wal ilm, something about faith and knowledge. That's the first category uh, or the first type of chapter. Number two, ahkam, legal rulings, right? Ahkam. Most hadith books have only ahkam. Only number two, they have nothing to do, like, so the Sahih of Imam Muslim, for instance, um, Abu Dawood, and Nasa'i, it's all Kitab al Wudu, even the Muatta. The first chapter in Muatta is what? What is the, the first chapter? How does the Imam Muatta begin his, Imam Malik begin his Muatta? Yeah, the timings of prayer. That's interesting. That's, that tells you what these books are. And, so, but a jamir is something that goes beyond that, not just ahkam, but prior to that adds iman, kitabul iman, kitabul ilm. Number three, uh, siya, which has to do with battles or treatment of <clears throat> your combatants, rules of international relations. It's like a broad category, like politics, you can say. Uh, number four, adab, manners and etiquette. So you won't find that in ahkam book because it's not really haram halal, it's just how to sit, how to eat, and you know, some of those etiquettes and manners. Number five, tafsir. Ahkam book, Abu Dawood, that has no tafsir. It's not interested in teaching you tafsir, because it's interested in teaching you how to pray. And the ibadat, ahkam. So tafsir would be in a jamir collection, a chapter on tafsir. Then the jamir collection would also add number six, fitta, trials and tribulations. There's a whole category. You know, what would happen at the end of times and things like that. Or the Asa's favorite time. That's it for last number. So trials and tribulations, signs of the day of judgment, things like that. So signs of the day of judgment, Ashratu Sari is number seven, actually. So fit in our trials and tribulation, then the signs themselves is a separate category. And then number eight, the final one is Manaqib. Manaqib are virtues. So the virtues of the Ansar, the virtues of Medina, the virtues of such and such. So these are the eight major chapters. So this is basically everything you can think of. So hadith relating to all of this. Um, among the six books, which one are Jamia? Well, Bukhari, obviously, what else? Muslim is also a Jamia to a lesser extent. It has very little tafsir, but it is kind of oriented on a Jamia pattern. Tirmidhi, yes. Yeah. Tirmidhi is also a Jamia collection. 
but the greatest of the three is Imam al Bukhari, the most comprehensive. So it's basically Bukhari. Muslim is like to a lesser extent, and Tirmidhi um, also is focused on Ahkam, but to a lesser extent is Jamia. So these are the this is the title. So Al Jamia, um, and then what's the second one? Al Musnad. So what is Al Musnad? This is Hadith 102. Who memorized the Bekuniya? The line in the Bekuniya. You're waiting, right? You're going to memorize everything at the end of next year. Anyone online memorize? Well, Musnadul. Well, Musnadul Muttasil is Nadimi. Okay, continue. Rawihi. Hatta al Mustafa Walam Yedin. Jazakallah khair. So this is Wal Musnadul Muttasilul Isnadi Min Rawihi Hatta al Mustafa Faliyabin. Al Yastabin. So Al Musnad is that which is Muttasil Al Isnadi Min Rawihi Hatta al Mustafa. So what does that mean? It means it's a connected Isnad to what? To the Prophet. So why does he include that? I say, well, aren't all hadith like that? Are all hadith like that? No. So what book is similar to the Sahih Bukhari, but it's not Musnad? Okay. No, but it's not similar to Bukhari. Something's as authentic as Bukhari, but it has the Muatta. The Muatta has not only prophetic hadith, but it has more non-prophetic hadith than prophetic hadith. You know, the hadith of companions, hadith of what Omar said, what Abu Bakr said, what the scholars of Medina said. So that is a hadith as well, hadith maqoof, hadith maqtur. But Musnad means it's only going back to the Prophet. So what are we learning so far? Imam al-Bukhari is trying to teach you some, a lot more. His vision is much grander. That's the first thing. al Musnad, he's, he's only focused on the Messenger of Allah, so, so eliminating all the rest. You can say eliminating all the noise, just to focus on what really matters. That's, that's amazing if you think about what he was doing. So Al Musnad, he's only going to teach you hadith going back to the Prophet. Doesn't mean he doesn't care about everything else. He uses other things in his other books and he references them as side points. But the Sahih of Imam al Bukhari is teaching you um, only things going back to the Prophet, something that's undisputed. Um, so that's Al Musnad. So first word. We're done with the second word. Number three. What's the third word? As Sahih. So Sahih is okay. Who, somebody has to memorize the Sahih. What are the five conditions of Sahih? I only brought that up in almost every session. The five conditions of Sahih Hadith from the two lines. And it's the first line of Bayakuniya, the first real line. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so now at this advanced stage, we want the lines, we want the words, we want the memorization, we don't want the. فالأول الصحيح وهو ما تصل إسناده ولم يشذ أو يعل. يرويه عدل ضابط عن مثله معتمد في ضبطه ونقله. So five conditions are in hadith. So these are hadith narrations that have all those conditions. And I'm not going to go through the conditions yet. We'll look, maybe look at them later. But we did all of hadith one or two. The conclusion of that was to look at these conditions. What makes the hadith the highest level of authenticity? It's five things. So that's what Bukhari, these, where did this definition come from? These five conditions? They're Bukhari's conditions. They're Imam al Bukhari's conditions. They're not Tirmidhi's conditions. In Tirmidhi, you have three conditions that make Sahih for him and for the other books. So Imam al Bukhari had the stringest criteria, the strictest criteria. He had these five conditions connected, it's not every narrator is academically accurate, any good memory or notes, uh, morally upright. Uh, there's no hidden weakness, there's no hidden, there's no contradiction with stronger evidence. So, uh, so Sahih. So Imam al-Bukhari, 
was actually, this was a novel move on his part to compile only Hadith or Sahih. And he got quite the uh, criticism for that because no one else did that before. Whenever you do something new, there's always going to be pushback from the community, from the world. And everyone who did something new, whether it was the four Imams of Fiqh, these Muhaddithin, they brought something new. All of them had uh, heavy criticism they had to deal with. So, you know, even today, like, just think about a whole discussion about Sahih Hadith versus weak, weak Hadith. You know, look at how much pushback we all get for advocating that we don't care about weak Hadith, we just want to look at sound Hadith. Every Imam goes against you. Well, I'm not, I'm exaggerating, but predominantly most imams, most scholars, most people in the community, most students of knowledge, they get so upset. Like, how are you eliminating the entire tradition? Why would you leave all of these beautiful gems out? You think the Sunnah is only in the Sahih Hadith? You think only Bukhari knows what Sahih? You think only Bukhari's collection has all the Sunnah? So even today, 2023, you have such a pushback against this idea of only relying on strong Sahih Hadith. Imagine when Imam al-Bukhari did it 1100 years ago. He did get pushed back, but he stuck to his vision. And because of that, he reached that stature that he reached today. So number three, Sahih. He's only going to include Sahih reports in this remarkable book. And not just Sahih, Sahih with those five conditions. So better one way of looking at it, Shir Hakam tells us, uh, uh, this is a sahu sahih. So Imam al Bukhari, he wanted to collect only a sahu sahih, uh, the cream of the crop, the things that the, the reports that reached the highest stage, undisputed stage. So the things that the reports that make it to the sahih of Imam al Bukhari, you can say they're undisputed in their authenticity. They're the highest level. You can talk about their meanings, what they mean, but as reports, as things that were established as coming from the Prophet. So there's nothing matched to that. It is unmatched. So al-Musnad, um, and then you have a sahih And then what's the fourth word? Well, any questions so far? Jamia, Musnad, Sahih. Questions? Yes. No, it's not Musnad. That's why Imam Bukhari includes that. The Muatta is definitely not Musnad, because it contains more non marfu reports than, than marfu reports. Now there's a reason for that. He had his own reasons for compiling the Mu'atta. Uh, so Muslim, any questions on Sahih? What's the fourth word? Mukhtasar. Mukhtasar, what does that mean, Mukhtasar? Abbreviated. OK, that's one way of looking at it. Um, it could be selection. Abridgement, selection, abbreviation. Um, so this is a word that has caused quite a lot of confusion in the Muslim community. I'm going to talk about this tomorrow because I don't want to put everything for today. It's 9.30. But so what does mukhtasar mean to you? You want to see mukhtasar? Most important, OK. Condensed, OK. What is it? Mukhtasar wouldn't be comprehensive, it would be opposite. Mukhtasar means you take some things from, so you have a whole bunch of things here, this would be comprehensive. Then you select some from that, and Mukhtasar is like an abridgment. So when you have Mukhtasar Sahih al-Bukhari, for instance, it would be a one volume, selections from Sahih bukhari selections from Tafsir, selections from this or that. That would be called Mukhtasar. So, so he put Mukhtasar in the title. So that means it isn't a, some type of abridgment, some type of selection. So, you know, that, so there's a number of possibilities here. One possibility is that Imam Bukhari had all these Sahih Hadith, and not to make it long, he just selected some and put them in here. But if you have that understanding, then there's a lot of Sahih Hadith out there. Then Bukhari loses his stature because it's just a selection. Then you could have other books that are sahih. So then someone would have to come along and compile all of them and come up with a comprehensive work. 
And there are people that did that or tried to do that because they had this understanding. And the people who give you uh, pushback against um, rejecting weak hadith, they'll say, well, Bukhari was just a selection. So there are many other hadith we, we're going to have to look at. So that's one way of looking at Muqtasar. And I'm going to show you tomorrow why that fails to understand what Bukhari did. And that's a wrong understanding. And that leads to so much confusion. There's still scholars today that have that understanding. And Muqtasar is just an abridgment. If it's just an abridgment, then well, everything we're talking about is meaningless. And Bukhari just made a selection. Why are we studying in such exhaustive detail, comparing to other books and this is the cream of the crop. If, is it the cream of the crop? Or is it just a selection? So that's the point, right? So we can, uh, we'll talk about that tomorrow. Just keep that in the back of your mind. Muhtasar is some type of selection of Imam al-Bukhari. Well, what kind of selection is it? A random selection or is it? So that's, that's what we're going to look at tomorrow. Um, and then what's the next words? Min. Umuri Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa From the, what's umur? Affairs, from amr, command or affair. Min umur Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, this is al-jami al-musul al-sahih al-mukhtasar. Of what? Of the matters relating to the Messenger of Allah. Wa sunanihi. Wa sunanihi. What's the singular of sunan? Sunnah. So a sunnah, the plural of sunnah is sunan. So from his practices, his sunnah. So his affairs from his practices, you know, how he worshiped, what he did in specific occasions, sunan. Wa ayyamihi, the last word ayyamihi. What is ayyamihi? His days, yeah. So that's history, exactly. The day of Badr, the day of Uhr, the day he did this, the day he did that. So. The days themselves, that would be his history. So like Sira, that's, you know, you can say Sira. So, so you can see the first word and the last words have this comprehensive nature to it. And Jami'a is the first word. Last word, Umuri Rasulillah wa Sunanihi wa Ayyamihi. So Imam Bukhari is trying to bring you much more. Not just giving you one thing. He's trying to give you everything. He's trying to give you so much trying to give you everything that you need. So his vision is grand. His, what he's trying to accomplish is grand. So this is very, very important to know. So this, if you read what people have said about the title, there's a lot of discussion about the title. Um, one of our teachers, great Sheikh Abdul Waqil al-Hashimi, al-Hashimi of Mecca, the senior muhaddith of Mecca. Um, so he, his father was Abdul Haq. He wrote a book, and in this book he wrote uh, about the title of Imam al-Bukhari. So he says uh, about this title, إِنَّمَا سَمَّاهُ جَامِعًا لِأَنَّهُ جَمَعَ فِيهِ الْفُنُونُ الثَّمَانِيَةِ is really, uh, Imam al-Bukhari called it Jamia because he combined the eight uh, branches or eight uh, chapters, and he mentioned them. وَسَمَّاهُ مُسْنَدًا لِأَنَّهُ أَوْرَدَ فِيهِ أَحَادِيثِ Al Musnad in Al Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He named it Musnad because he's only going to include hadith of, that go back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If he includes other non prophetic material, it's only supporting material, not in the primary corpus. Well, that's an important point we'll come to. Um, and he named it Sahih because he's only going to include those reports that are Sahih in his uh, mind. And then, uh, And he named it Muhtasar because he had a, from an array of 600,000 hadith, he selected the ones that were going to be in the Sahih of Imam al Jamil, uh, Sahih of uh, al Jami al-Sahih. So from 600,000 hadith that he learned, that he had at his disposal, that it was at his memory, he selected the 7,000 or so that he put in this work. And we'll look at tomorrow, how was that selection? A random selection? Or did that have also a purpose and a meaning behind it? Now, 
quick word about the title. Um, there are other versions of the title out there. So interestingly, Fatul Bari, Ibn Hajar's Fatul Bari mentions a different title. And it's a title you don't find in most manuscripts. There's a title most scholars didn't accept. So for some reason, Ibn Hajar used this following title, Al Jami al Sahih Al Musnad Min Hadithi Rasulillah Sallallahu Sunanihi Wa Ayyamihi. So it doesn't have Muhtasar in there. Um, so, and then it has Hadith instead of Umur. So it's a slightly different title. And there's a lot of like discussion about how that could happen. Because uh, the main title, that's in all the manuscripts. That's the title accepted by Imam Nawawi, Ibn Salah, uh, and a lot of other scholars. Most of the experts of Hadith, this is the title that they have. And this is a picture from an actual manuscript from hundreds of years ago. And you can see the title is the way we read it. Um, so Sheikh Abdul Fattah Abu Huda, um, the teacher of many of our teachers, he has a beautiful book, 100 pages, Tahtid Ismay As-Sahihain, a research into the names of the Sahihain, Wa Ismu Jamir Tirmidhi. And he discusses a different title. He says the proper title is this one. And he discusses its ambivalence of how, uh, why Ibn Hajar would make a mistake like this. And, you know, uh, he, he gives his explanation perhaps is because he was compiling the book, or at this moment he was preoccupied. Um, he comes up with some type of explanation that's not very convincing. But in any event, um, it's something important to know that sometimes the titles might be like a word here and there, might be off, one word might be later, one word might be er earlier, or there might be a bigger change like in the change, like in Fatr al-Badi. So this is important because uh, when you study books, you really have to go back to the earlier manuscripts and that's what real scholarship is, like you have to be aware of these differences. It's not just that you have Sahih Bukhari and just read it and everything's word to word. There could be printing mistakes, there could be a mistake of a scholar. Uh, and there are plenty of examples of printing mistakes, and I'll show you even major mistakes. I'll show you a mistake that's in a Darussalam edition of Sahih Bukhari that will shock you. Um, and when I saw it, I mean, I still have it on my show, but I'll bring it. They would look at that and it will shock you. Um, so you always have to be aware of these things. That's human nature. There are always going to be mistakes that creep up. But that's what I wanted to say about the title. So, yeah. The titles? No, actually, so it's not like Fat Imam Ibn Hajr wasn't translating. He was coming, he was doing a shah commentary. So it comes across in, in referencing. So referencing is broader than translation. So when you reference work, sometimes, you know, all of us do that. When you reference a book, sometimes we'll summarize the name, or we'll say the name, but we'll skip a word. It's just a natural thing. So that's probably what's happening. People are referencing these books. So I keep saying Sahih al-Bukhari. That's not the name, right? So all of us, we call it Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih of Imam Bukhari. The real name is this, but Who's going to say that every single time you refer to the book, right? So you have to abbreviate and, and summarize sometimes. And perhaps in that abbreviation and summary and discussions, these mistakes happen. People realize, people start using these names and forget the original name. But that's why it's important to look at the original title. I think I didn't follow the slide. Um, yeah, uh, what do you have in the Turkish one? Yeah, so it doesn't have the title, yeah. So this is this is a page from one of the earliest manuscripts on the bottom. So I took a picture and um, so you can see, um, if you can read it, it's an older way of reading, but if you zoom in, Jamil al Jamia. Jamil Jamia means all of, all of the what? This is the name. Al Jamia, al Sahih, al Musnad. Uh, Al-Musnad, what's the next word? Muhtasar. Min Hadith. Here it says Hadith. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was Sunani. It doesn't have Ayyamihi. Or maybe a Harikara. So, 
So this is how you look at the manuscript. Sometimes when the person writing, he'll, he'll mix it up or he'll drop a word here and there. But the full proper title is on top. That's why I want to show you that. In general, we'll say Sahih al-Mukhtasar in Umuri Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sunanihi wa iyanihi. Any other questions? So will the example with that with the word Muqtasar be in the in the Bible as well? If you go and read with maybe the person who's doing that explanation, maybe you put it in there. You're saying possibly it came later, rather from Imam al Bukhari? Or in the in the borders. Yeah, so I mean if someone's trend so someone's translating and commenting on a book or transcribing a book, sometimes you'll you mix up the order, or sometimes you might feel the order should be different and you'll put it. But you as an author, sometimes you have that luxury, that that leeway, flexibility. Um, but now, what is the real name? According to Imam Bukhari, we don't care what the name should be, what Imam Bukhari named it. Then that required research. So then what do people do? Shaykh Abu Fatah Abu Buddha, he says in his book, he looked at all these early manuscripts, looked at original pictures, but the earliest ones he could find. And we're finding new ones all the time. We're finding new ones that weren't there when these scholars wrote their books like 100 years ago or 50 years ago. So whenever you find a new manuscript, you look at it, it kind of solves a lot of problems. Um, so for instance, like I, I was sharing Tajweed, there is a, so Ibn al-Jazri, Muqaddima Ibn al-Jazri, what's the famous line? Who remembers the line about Tajweed? You know, um, what's the next line? So that's Ibn al Jazari. He wrote this famous line that's so widely quoted. Akhdu bit tajweed hatmun lazimu. Reciting with tajweed is something mandatory. Man lam yujawid al Qur'ana athimu. What does that mean? Yeah, whoever does not tajweed of the Qur'an is a sinner. Athimu. So I found. So when you see the little book of Muqaddimat Ibn al-Jazari, there's one version had, مَنْ لَمْ يُسَحِّهِ الْقُرْآنَ آثِمُ مَنْ لَمْ يُجَوِّدِ الْقُرْآنَ مَنْ لَمْ يُسَحِّهِ الْقُرْآنَ So first time I saw that, I felt it was a mistake, so maybe someone just changed يُجَوِّد to يُسَحِّ The meaning is the same or similar meaning. Um, but how do you solve problems like that? You have to look at early manuscripts. So what happened is, um, Sheikh Khalid once called me, um, or he called someone and then he referred to me. So someone found out that there is an original copy of Tayyib al-Nashr, Ibn al-Jazari's work in Princeton University Library. So someone in Medina, when the scholars were looking at it, they wanted pictures of that. So Sheikh Khalid doesn't live here, then he reached out to me. So I registered with the Princeton University Library. They have thousands of manuscripts, original manuscripts. So. Long story short, I went there to look at this manuscript. So this is a binding. The book is kind of like this with a leather binding. It has the entire Tayyib al which is, uh, you know, uh, hundreds of lines of poetry written by Ibn al-Jazari about the readings of the Quran. And the special thing about this manuscript, um, at the end it says, I have written this in the Haram and read it to Ibn al-Jazari in front of the Kaaba, and Ibn al-Jazari signed it at the end. And then you see his signature, Ibn al-Jazari's signature, original. So this is a book that Ibn al-Jazari had in his hand. Today we memorize his poetry, but you still have a lot of these books that, uh, but Imam al-Bukhari, we don't have stuff that was written in his lifetime, because that's a thousand years ago. Material doesn't survive that long. But we have manuscripts that go back to like a couple of generations after him, and they refer to the original copies. So why, why am I mentioning Ibn al-Jazari? Because when I looked up this line in there, it said, مَنْ لَمْ يُجَوِّدِ الْقُرْآنَ آثِمُ And on the side in red ink, يُسَحْحِ It had it on top of it. That means Ibn al-Jazari was aware of both readings, and he, he allowed both. So both of them go back to Ibn al-Jazari. So it's not that one is a mistake. So this is how you look at original manuscripts and figure out 
little details like that. But that stuff is very, very advanced. That's what scholars do when they look at books because you know you have to figure out, okay, is this coming from the author, the translator, or is it from Imam Bukhari himself, or is it a printing mistake, or is it coming from somewhere else? Allah Bukhari. Any other questions? How are we doing on time? Okay. Let me read the first hadith. That's the first word, at least, or the first, because we don't want to leave any session without reading the sahih. Okay. So I'm going to talk about manuscripts later, uh, tomorrow or on the subsequent sessions. So when you have Sahih Bukhari, this is kind of what it looks like. This is from my book. So I, this is my uh, favorite copy. It's uh, from Istanbul, the Turkish print. And our brother here has another version of that. It's very beautiful. So when you look at Sahih Imam al-Bukhari, this is the first page. Um, and you can see Bab, you can see various things there. So it's, um, so being that we're reading Sahih al-Bukhari, um, we want to start reading the books ourselves, right? Um, so, somebody read from the beginning. So let's just read the page. Who wants to, just with the microphone. Read from your copy, or read from the screen. Who has a mic? Where's the mic? Okay. Who wants to volunteer to read? I can. Okay, go ahead, sister. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Hola, Sheikh. قال الشيخ الإمام الحافظ أبو عبد الله محمد بن إسماعيل بن إبراهيم بن المغيرة بن البخاري البخاري رحمه الله تعالى آمين بابو كيف كان؟ Okay, let's stop there. So, so if you're looking at your 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 book, قال الشيخ الإمام الحافظ أبو عبد الله محمد بن إسماعيل بن إبراهيم بن المغيرة البخاري رحمه الله تعالى I mean, so did Bukhari write that? Why not? Huh? Yeah, so so you have to know, so just now trying to get you to read and trying to understand how to read. So books generally in the beginning, they have these introductions. Um, so this is not Imam al-Bukhari speaking. He starts with Bab, okay? So every book that you get, generally there's an Isnad in the beginning. This one, I think previous page has the Isnad. So every book generally is read with Isnad, okay? So the students would read the books to the teachers and that's how the books are transmitted, they're traditional books. So books of Hadith like Ibn Hajar's Fatul Bari, the beginning he has five, six pages documenting all his teachers, their teachers, going back to Imam Bukhari, then he begins Bismillah. So that's generally how books begin. There's always a preamble that comes from the person transmitting the book. So, and then when we read in our times with the purpose of Ijazah or Isnad, you always read to whatever teacher you're reading, you read, you always begin by saying, Wa bi isnadikal mutasil ilal musannifi Imam al Bukhari qal. And then you read the book. That way you link yourself, your isnad, literally just said with your isnad, reading to the teacher, going back to the author who said, and then you read like this. So you always have that link to these books. So that's how we read these books. Um, and then, but just knowing my, who's Qalashe, who's writing this, the one who transmitted the Sahih. Here it doesn't say who transmitted it, but more reliable manuscripts will say Al Farabri or whoever the student was. Um, so, so far, and there's Bismillah Rahman Rahim, that's not from Imam al-Bukhari, that's from the printer. So, so far, we got up to here, we haven't read the Sahih yet, even though it's in Sahih al-Bukhari. So, 
So now continue, sister. Bob. باب كيف كان بدأ الوحي إلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وقول الله وقول الله جل ذكره إن أوحينا إليك كما أوحينا إلى روح والنبيين من بعده والنبيين من بعده Okay, stop here. So now the very first thing, باب. What does باب mean? Chapter. It means door. But that's how you put like separations of books. So this is the first chapter. So first chapter, Bab, Kayfa kana bad'ul wahi ila rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa How was the beginning of revelation to the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Okay. So the very first thing, the first chapter, how revelation began. So, so one thing about Bab, is it Babu or Babun? That's important to know. So it's two ways of doing it. So you can say Babun, chapter, period. Then you say, Kayfa kana badul wahi. That's one way of reading it. But another way of reading it is Babu, the chapter of, and then everything after that would be in the Majroor case. So Babu kayfa kana bad and then you see there's a dhamma and a kasra on there you see that here that's why his sister I think hesitated the qawl has a dhamma and a kasra you all, all you guys have that or not dhamma and kasra it does okay what about the physical ones uh, you have dhamma and kasra and qawl you do because yeah you have the same edition i have the turkish one yeah check the other one see if it has it so if bab if you read it like babun as a separation by itself then it will be qawlullah as in the speech of allah the words of allah and he quotes the first but if you put it with bab as a sentence babu qawlillahi then it will be qawlillahi just grammar okay not that important, but now this is an advanced seminar, so you can't tell me you're getting too technical here. This is a fifth class, so now you have the right to do that. Qawlu, okay, this one has qawlu, okay. So, qawli lahi jalla dhikruhu, and then the verse he quotes um, is, inna awhayna ilayka kama awhayna ila nuhin wa nabiyyina min barbi. So he quotes a verse, Verily we have revealed to you the way we revealed to Nuh and the prophets after him. So, so the first thing we learn here is, what's the first thing in Imam Bukhari's book? I mean, there's a chapter, but what's the first content? Quran. That's important. And that tells you Imam Bukhari was a Quran you. Even though people think of oh, Bukhari, Hadith, rejectors of Quran, and they don't emphasize Quran, real Muhaddithin, everything is linked to a Quranic worldview. Every chapter begins with Quran. First thing in Sahih Bukhari is Quranic verse. So every single chapter, when he's teaching you something, trying to decipher an issue, learning about something, he'll bring a verse of Quran first if there's one on that topic. And then he'll bring the Sunnah, the Hadith. That's important. So this is early scholars, they were, you know, Quran based. And that's something people misunderstand. And, and, you know, they're like, oh, only Hadith, Hadith, these people only did Hadith and they ignored the Quran. Read they had these people don't even read the books. They just criticize without being aware of what in, in the books. So the purpose of Sahih is to teach you Sunnah, to guide you, but to in the framework of the Quran, the Quran is the primary guidance. So that's important. That's one point that's very, very important. And then in the chapter, the chapter is about how revelation began. The very first thing, the verse he, he shares with us, Inna awhayna ilayka kama awhayna ila nuhin wa min ba'di. And then the rest of the verse, he doesn't quote the rest of it, it says, awhayna ila Ibrahima wa Ismaila wa Ishaqa wa Yaquba wa al-asbati 
وعيسى وايوب ويونس وهارون وسليمان واتينا داوود زبوا this one of the most comprehensive verses mentioning the names of the prophets one verse you have more names of prophets than any other verse and this is the verse imam bukhari began with and you have to think so now you know you can only benefit from the sahih al bukhari if you think and every single thing you read you have to think why title why chapter why why this verse why not another verse there's a reason for that at the very least you want to get into the mind of a great thinker like bukhari what was he trying to teach us you know what is he doing for us so there's something special about this verse so it's about revelation how revelation began and every everything in here makes sense there's an order there's a wisdom to the selection of the verses to the arrangement of the hadith to the why this is the first chapter and so on and so forth so i'll get into that more tomorrow but so so far first chapter is how revelation began first verse allah revealed the revelation to you and to the great prophets before you and now to you and then first hadith now someone else read so we read the verse now read the hadith someone from this audience read the hadith and i'm going to end that's my final point i'm just going to we'll read the it's not but someone can read from the screen just pass the mic over read it in the mic because online students قال حدثنا سفيان قال حدثنا يحيى ابن سعيد الانصاري قال اخبرني محمد ابن ابراهيم التيمي التيمي انه سمع علقمه ابن وقاص الليثي يقول سمعت عمر او عمر ابن الخطاب رضي الله عنه على المنبر قال سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول انما الاعمال بالنيات وانما لكل امرئ ما نوى فمن كانت هجرته الى فمن كانت هجرته الى الدنيا يصيبها او الى او الى امراه ينكحها فهجرته الى ما هاجر اليه. Very good. Exactly. And then it says hadathana. That hadathana is a marker for the next hadith. So we read the first hadith. Um, we're not going to go through the hadith, but I just want to go through Imam Bukhari selected who as his first teacher. So well, what's the first name in the Isnad? You make Al Khumaydi. So now the final point I want to end with I told you everything is meaningful in this book. This is a book for thinkers. So why does he choose Humaydi? You will say, well, he learned this hadith about the Niyyah from Humaydi. Yes, but he learned the hadith from hundreds of teachers. And this hadith of the Niyyah appears in Sahih Bukhari maybe a dozen times. I don't have the exact number, but many, many, eight or nine times, I believe. All from different teachers. So Imam Bukhari has this hadith from a variety of teachers, and he includes them in the Sahih. And they're all in different chapters of the Sahih, the same hadith, through different teachers and different isnads coming back to Omar. So why would he put this one here? And why would he put this teacher first? So the first, so the first thing he puts in the book is a verse that teaches you something. The first teacher he has in this book is Humaydi. Who was Humaydi? We can talk about who he was, maybe that has something to do with it. Anyone has any insight? At the very least, you need to think. You need to figure out, okay, wait, there's got to be a reason who made these first. Like he had a thousand teachers that he relates from in this book. Um, so from a thousand teachers, he puts Humaydi number one. And when you, so in this, in this chap, in this Sahih, when you read the Sahih, you're going to have so many wow moments. You're going to have moments where you will be shocked or you will just, you know, it's stuff that amazes you. 
Does it that that will increase your resolve in you know your in the stature of Imam al-Bukhari as a thinker? So Khomeini, anyone know anything about Khomeini? No. Okay. So his name was Abdullah ibn Zubair al-Khomeini. He died in the year 219. So two things about him. You might say, ah, he was from Mecca, and he, he was of the Quraysh, Quraysh lineage. So a brief biography about him. Um, he was one of the best students of Sufyan ibn Uyayna. <clears throat> Sufyan ibn Uyayna, Muhaddith of Mecca. So he was one of his best students. Um, he was also a student and companion of Imam Shafiri. In fact, he traveled with Shafiri to learn from Sufyan ibn Uyayna in Mecca. Shafiri was from where? What did I tell you he was from? Mecca. Sufyan ibn Uyayna from Mecca. Khomeini? Mecca, from Mecca. So Khomeini is narrating from who? Sufyan ibn Uyayna. So Khomeini was so uh, such a strong student of Shafiri. When Imam Shafiri died in Egypt, um, he eventually settled in Egypt. Uh, Khomeini was supposed to take over his spot as teaching spot, but politics forced him out. Some other student took over, and then he had to leave. So he went back to Mecca and taught Hadith in Mecca. So he was a teacher of Bukhari and many others. So he was a great Imam. Uh, Imam Ahmad said about him, "Al Khomeini indana imamun." Khomeini is a great Imam for us. So he, uh, Shafiri praised him as an expert. He says, "Ma ra'aytu sahibun, um, sahibu balam ahfad min al Khomeini. Kana yahfadu li Sufyan ibn Uyayna ashrat alaf hadith." He said, "I have not seen a person who, who was more preserving of hadith and Khomeini." Who's speaking? Shafiri. He says he used to memorize. He memorized tens of thousands of hadith from Sufyan. Uh, Khomeini himself used to say. Uh, he says, as long as I am here in Mecca, Imam Ahmad is in Iraq, Imam Ishaq ibn Rahawi is in Khurasan, we got this down. Nobody can take over. We got this. So, meaning this how great he was as a, as a person. Bukhari used to say, Al Khumaydiyu, Imam fil Hadith. So, coming back to that question, so Khomeini, why Khomeini comes first? What do you think? So, there's no answer here. Imam Bukhari doesn't give you the answer, you have to think about it. And it makes perfect sense when you come up with the answer. But what do you think? Why would Khomeini come first? Yes, let's hear from sisters. Yeah. No, he did, but but I also mentioned he had dozens of teachers who taught him this hadith, and a lot of those teachers he puts their hadith in here. So why, like you have to ask why? Why you put Khomeini first? Look at the chapter. How did revelation begin? So where did revelation begin? Makkah. All the teachers, he selected one from Mecca and one from the Quraysh. He's teaching you between the lines. Revelation began in Mecca. The revelation, Allah revealed the Quran to the Quraysh. So look at that. That's not even the Hadith. It has nothing to do with the Hadith. The Hadith has nothing to do with revelation. It's about Niyyah. It has something indirectly to do with it. But a brilliant mind like that is unbelievable. He's, uh, he's teaching you in between the lines. When Prophet migrated from Mecca to what? Medina. Guess what? The second hadith is Imam Malik's hadith from Medina. So there's a wisdom to the order. Starts in Mecca, second is in Medina. And he puts it in the Isnaz. He has so much at his disposal. The brilliant minds like that, they just like, they're teaching you amazing things. The very second hadith right here, Hadathana Abdullah ibn Yusuf al Tirmisi, great scholar of Medina. And he relates from Imam Malik, Imam of Medina. So the very first hadith begins with the Makkan teacher, 
you know, good teacher for two, three levels. The second hadith, Medinan teacher, Medinan teacher. And he has the hadith from other teachers. But that's, that's who he was. This, a, this shows you the mind of Imam al-Bukhari. When you think about and study in detail, you will learn these amazing insights. There's so much, so much gems you can extract from this book. If you read it properly, if you think about it, you have to think. It's not going to come easy. We'll end with that. And alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. With that, anyone has to leave, can leave. You know, it's late. It's 10 04. Um, and I'll open the floor for questions. And we'll continue uh, tomorrow any of these topics. Anyone online have a question? Anyone here? Yeah, so the ayah is muhtasar, yeah, right? So I just quoted the full so you know what the verse is about. So sometimes he'll quote even hadith and ikhtisar just to where he's teaching is the main point it looks like he wants to give you is that Allah says he revealed the Quran to the prophets and now this book is about our messenger. And so he, that's so he didn't need to include all the names of the other messengers. So he included the first part of the verse. Wow. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so good question. Question is, um, I'm gonna have to repeat it because he doesn't like using the microphone. He wants me to work. So the other scholars, um, the other scholars, the verses before hadith like this, um, yeah, so there's a famous book we all read that always begins with verses too. What is that book? Riyad al-Salihin. It's a beautiful book. Always begins with the verses and then the hadith. So that was a common practice. Um, it's not, Imam al-Tirmidhi doesn't do that. I don't think Imam Muslim doesn't do that at all. Um, Imam Bukhari does. Uh, Imam Nawawi did and others did. Anyone else? No one? That's it, Blake. Are you going to relate it to the eight signs of the day of judgment? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have eight sessions for this. Yeah, because Wednesday, Thursday, eight sessions, we have to finish this first chapter. And so far, we did the title, we did the first name of this now. But I don't know, there's a lot more to cover. Inshallah, we'll, we'll be able to do it. First chapter, inshallah. We want to finish the first chapter. It's about eight or nine hadith. Anyone else? No one online has a question? Okay, for people who are here, um, pray Aisha downstairs if it's time. Anyone who has to leave can leave. And tomorrow we'll continue the sessions, inshallah. There's a lot more to cover. I didn't talk about the manuscripts. I didn't talk about versions. We'll continue doing that tomorrow, inshallah. Fatahallahu alaykum jamiyan. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.